Hello and welcome to Lucid Mind Chemistry channel with Majid. In this video, I'll be solving Chemistry O Levels Alternative to Practical Paper 41 from May June 2020. You can go to any particular question by following timestamps given in the video description. Let's start. Question 1 A student investigates a sample of rock salt. The student grinds the rock salt into a powder then places the powder into a beaker and adds water to it, stirs the mixture, pours the mixture through the apparatus shown. This is the apparatus. We have two things. One is this filter funnel. Second is this conical flask. Brown solid is the mixture of salt with water, which is filtered and then colorless solution is obtained. Name apparatus A. Now apparatus A used is filter funnel. So we can write filter funnel name apparatus B now apparatus B is conical flask you can also write Erlenmeyer flask A brown solid remains in apparatus A. A colorless solution is collected in apparatus B. Name the process used to separate the solid from the colorless solution. Now this process in which filter funnel is used is called filtration. Part B. The colorless solution contains two different cations. One cation is sodium. The student adds dilute nitric acid and aqueous sodium sulfate to the colorless solution. A white precipitate is formed. Name the other cation in the colorless solution. Now one of the cation is sodium and sodium does not form any precipitate because all sodium salts are soluble. So what happens that there is one another cation that is present which gives white precipitate with sulfate. So it could be barium because barium in the presence of nitric acid and sodium sulfate aqueous it forms white precipitate of barium sulfate which is insoluble so the other cation that is present in the colorless solution could be barium Part C, a student investigates the effect of adding different masses of rock salt to the temperature of a mixture of ice and water. The diagram shows the volume of water the student uses in the investigation. State the volume of water the student uses. Now we can see that water is present in measuring cylinder and this is the level of water. As this digit represents 15 cm cube, so it is 1 above which is 16 cm cube. So we can write 16 centimeter cube. Part D, the student places the water in a beaker, adds ice, stirs the mixture, measures the lowest temperature of the mixture, repeats the experiment four times. In each of the repeated experiment, a different mass of rock salt is added to the mixture. Number one, state a variable that needs to be kept constant in each experiment. As the student places the water in a beaker, so the volume of water is a variable that should be kept constant. Again, he adds ice, so the mass of ice is also a variable. Or you can say the surface area of ice. Because larger surface area increases the rate of physical process. Then he measures the lowest temperature of the mixture. So you can write any one of the variables such as mass of ice. Or you can also write surface area of ice. Or you can write volume of water. Part 2 the diagram shows part of the thermometer the student uses to measure the lowest temperature reached when 1 gram of rock salt is added. This is the thermometer and these are the readings. 
record this temperature in the table of results. Now we can see in the table of results for 1 gram the lowest temperature is empty so we have to find it from the given diagram. As we can see that this is the temperature that is reached by adding 1 gram of salt. So the temperature is 3, 3.5, then 6, 7, 8, 9. So it is negative 3.9 degree centigrade. So we can write negative 3.9 in place of temperature. 3. Plot the results on the grid. Include a suitable scale for the x-axis. A straight line of best fit. As we can see that the mass of rock salt is started from 0 to 2 grams. And there are 4 big boxes present on the x-axis so we can use a scale for mass of rock salt that each big box is equal to 0 0.5 grams of salt then 4 big boxes will be equal to 2.0 grams of salt. So it is 0 0.5 then 1 grams then 1.5 grams and then 2.0 grams. This here shows 0, 0.0 grams and as we can see from the table upon addition of 0, 0.0 grams the lowest temperature was 0, 0.0 degree centigrade. So this is the point for 0, 0.0 grams. From the table we can see that upon addition of 0, 0.5 grams of salt the temperature achieved is minus 1.9 degree centigrade. So this is the minus 1.9 degree centigrade place. So the point must come over here. Then upon addition of 1.0 grams of salt, the lowest temperature that is reached is minus 3.9 degree centigrade. So again, this is negative 3.9. So the point will come between this small box. For addition of 1.5 grams of rock salt, the temperature is minus 5.8. So this is minus 5.8. So we can put the spot at this point. Similarly for adding 2.0 grams, the temperature reached is minus 7.8. So this point comes over here. Let's draw the line of best fit. This is the best fit line as we can see that all points are coinciding with the line. Let's move further. Part 4. Use your graph to find the lowest temperature when 1.4 grams of rock salt is added. So as we can see that two small boxes equals 0 0.1 grams. So 1.4 grams will come over here. Let's find the lowest temperature by putting the same spot on the line. We can see that this is the point at which the line coincides. So this equals to minus 5.4 degree centigrade. So we can write minus 5.4 degree centigrade. Deduce the relationship between mass of rock salt added and the lowest temperature reached. As we can see that in the graph upon addition of rock salt what happens that the lowest temperature is reduced. So we can write that as mass of rock salt is increased. Temperature decreases. Question 2. Lime water is a saturated solution of calcium hydroxide. A student finds the mass of calcium hydroxide in 1 decimeter cube of lime water. The student measures 25 centimeter cube of lime water into a flask using a 100 centimeter cube measuring cylinder. 
adds few drops of methyl orange indicator to the flask places 0.100 mole per decimeter cube hydrochloric acid in a burette and takes an initial reading runs hydrochloric acid from the burette into the flask until the mixture changes color records the final reading and repeats the experiment two times initial and final readings for all titrations are shown in the diagrams as we can see that this is a titration experiment in which calcium hydroxide and hcl they react together in the presence of indicator which is methyl orange until methyl orange changes color these are the titration readings from the burette the first one is always initial and second one is final reading again this is initial and final for titration 2 and initial and final for titration 3 also you should remember that you must always take the volume from top to bottom for example this is 0, 0.0 centimeter cube this is 11.6 centimeter cube again the starting is 11.6 and the final reading is 23.7 for titration 3, the initial is 23.7 and final is 34.9. Use the information from the diagrams to complete the results in table. This is titration number 1. For 1, the initial reading is 0.0 cm3 and final reading is 11.6. For titration 2, initial is 11.6 and final is 23.7 similarly for third titration initial is 23.7 and final is 34.9 now the volume used can be obtained by subtracting these two values so the first value is 11.6 and subtracting these two the value comes equal to 12.1 while for the third one the value comes equal to 11.2 B part 1 the results are not consistent identify the apparatus the student uses that is not accurate enough for titration moving back to the question we can see that they have used 100 centimeter cube measuring cylinder so this is not accurate so we can write measuring cylinder Part 2 suggests a more accurate piece of apparatus that the student can use. Now instead of measuring cylinder, the student can use pipette or burette because pipette or burette is more accurate as compared to measuring cylinder. Part 3 The student adds the hydrochloric acid drop by drop near the end point of titration. Suggest why the hydrochloric acid is added drop by drop near the end point. This is actually done to make the readings more accurate so we can write that it is done to make readings more accurate part c the student repeats the whole experiment three more times using more accurate apparatus the results are shown in the table Again, there are three titrations with initial final readings and volume used. We have to find out the best titration results. So as we can see that these two values are close together. So therefore, these are the best titration results. Take the best titration results in the results table. So we can take this one and this one. Use the ticked values to calculate the average volume of 0.1 mole per decimeter cube HCl used. Now we can find the average of these two values by adding these up and dividing by 2 so it comes equal to 11.7 centimeter cube part 2 calculate the number of moles of HCl in the average volume of 0.1 mole per decimeter cube HCl as we know the formula number of moles is equal to concentration in mole per decimeter cube into volume in decimeter cube 
Now the volume is 11.7 cm3 which can be converted into decimeter cube by dividing by 1000. Concentration in mole per decimeter cube is given which is 0.1. The value comes equal to 0.00117 moles. Part 3. Calculate the number of moles of calcium hydroxide in 25 cm3 of lime water. This is the volume that was taken for titration with HCl. We can find the moles of calcium hydroxide from the given moles of HCl. From balanced equation, we know that one mole of calcium hydroxide requires two moles of HCl. So now 0.00117 moles of HCl are present. So the number of moles of calcium hydroxide will be x. We can cross multiply. So x will be equal to 0.00117 divided by 2. So the moles of calcium hydroxide come equal to 0 0.00585. Part 4. Calculate the number of moles of calcium hydroxide in 1 decimeter cube of lime water. As we can see that this number of moles was present in 25 centimeter cube. So for 1 decimeter cube we can multiply this value by 40. Or you can also do it like this. Volume ratio moles. So for 25 centimeter cube the number of moles were 0.00585. So for 1 decimeter cube which is equal to 1000 centimeter cube the volume will be x. So by cross multiplying the number of moles of calcium hydroxide come equal to 0.0234 moles. Part 5. Calculate the molecular mass of calcium hydroxide. The atomic mass is a given. For calcium it is 40, for hydrogen it is 1, for oxygen it is 16. As we have 1 calcium in calcium hydroxide, 2 oxygen atoms and 2 hydrogen atoms. So for 1 calcium it will be 1 into 40 which is the atomic mass of calcium. For 2 oxygen it will be 2 into 16 which is the atomic mass of oxygen. So it equals 32. For 2 hydrogen it will be 2 into 1 which is equal to 2. So it comes equal to 74. So molecular mass is 74. Part 6. Calculate the mass of calcium hydroxide in 1 decimeter cube of lime water. Give you answer to two significant figures. As we know the formula, mass in grams is equal to moles into molecular mass. Molecular mass obtained is 74 for calcium hydroxide and the number of moles in 1 decimeter cube of lime water is 0 0.0234 so we can write 0 0.0234 into 74 it comes equal to 1.7316 now we have to give answer to two significant figures so these are first two significant figures the answer is therefore 1.7 grams Question 3. Bromine, Chlorine, Fluorine and Iodine are elements in group 7 of the periodic table. Group 7 elements react with compounds of group 7 elements in aqueous solutions in displacement reactions. More reactive element displaces less reactive element from their compounds. For example, we can see that potassium iodide reacts with fluorine to form potassium fluoride and iodine. Now fluorine is more reactive than iodide so therefore fluorine has replaced iodide to form fluoride and iodine. You have access to colorless aqueous solutions of potassium bromide, potassium chloride, potassium iodide, aqueous solutions of bromine which is orange, chlorine which is yellow and iodine which is brown in color. The apparatus normally found in school laboratory. No other chemicals are available. Plan experiments using these solutions to show that chlorine is more reactive than bromine and iodine. So we have to do the experiments of chlorine with bromine solution and iodine solution 
Second is bromine is more reactive than iodine but less reactive than chlorine. So we have to do the reactions of bromine with iodine and with chlorine. Your plan must include what you need to do, the observations you expect, an explanation of how these observations show the order of reactivity of bromine, chlorine and iodine. As we know that in group 7, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine are present. Top one is more reactive than the bottom one so therefore reactivity decreases down in the group and top one can replace the bottom one easily while bottom one cannot replace the top one. For example chlorine can replace bromine and bromine can replace iodine but iodine cannot replace either of fluorine, chlorine or bromine. First thing is to find out the reactivity of chlorine as compared to bromine and iodine so what we will do is that first we will take clean and dry test tubes and then add aqueous chlorine to a solution of potassium bromide which is aqueous potassium bromide Now what will happen that chlorine can displace bromine because chlorine is above in the reactivity series as compared to bromine so what will happen that bromine will be displaced the solution will turn orange. This is because of the formation of bromine from potassium bromide. The equation for this reaction will be like this. Chlorine aqueous was added to potassium bromide aqueous and it has formed potassium chloride aqueous along with bromine which is orange in color. Second step would be to add aqueous chlorine to aqueous potassium iodide this is because now we are finding the reactivity of chlorine as compared to iodine so now the solution will turn brown or black solid This is because we have added chlorine to aqueous potassium iodide and chlorine has replaced iodine to form potassium chloride which is aqueous along with the formation of iodine which is purple black solid. Now we can explain these observations by showing the order of reactivity so we can say that the more reactive element displaces the less reactive element from their compounds. Again we can find the reactivity of bromine as compared to iodine and chlorine. So we can add aqueous bromine to potassium iodide which is aqueous. The solution will turn brown or black solid because of the formation of iodine. This can be shown by this reaction. We have bromine aqueous which was added to potassium iodide aqueous. So what happened that bromine actually displaced iodine 
So now potassium bromide along with solid iodine has formed. So it shows that the reactivity of bromine is more than iodine. Now let's compare the reactivity of bromine with chlorine. Now we can add aqueous bromine to aqueous potassium chloride No reaction will take place as chlorine is more reactive than bromine, so therefore bromine cannot displace chlorine. So this shows that bromine is less reactive than chlorine. Question 4. Scientists analyze a sample of soil. They discover that the soil contains nitrate ions, carbonate ions, and iron-free ions. Complete the tables to show the observation for of their tests. Name any gases formed and the state the tests use to identify them. Number 1 is the test on solid sample of soil. First is nitrate ion test and the test is that we have to add aqueous sodium hydroxide, then aluminum foil and warm gently. Now we know that when nitrate ion is added to sodium hydroxide aqueous in the presence of aluminum foil and heat, it releases ammonia gas. So the observations will be bubbles are formed. The test for this gas is that it turns red litmus to blue and the conclusion will be that this gas is ammonia. Second is the test for carbonate ions. We are adding dilute hydrochloric acid. Now we know that when acid reacts with carbonate it forms carbon dioxide and water. Now there is a test for carbon dioxide gas, first the observations, observations are similar, bubbles are formed. And these bubbles will turn lime water milky. So the conclusion is that carbon dioxide gas is present. Second are the tests on aqueous solution made from soil. The ion is iron plus 3 and the test is that they are adding aqueous sodium hydroxide. In the first test and in second test they are adding excess aqueous sodium hydroxide. Now iron plus 3 when reacts with sodium hydroxide aqueous, it forms iron hydroxide which is a reddish brown precipitate. So the observation is that reddish brown precipitate is formed. And when excess of sodium hydroxide is added to this reddish brown precipitate, it does not dissolve in excess. So we can write that reddish brown precipitate is insoluble in excess. Part B, the scientists also want to know the pH of the soil. They test the soil by shaking it with universal indicator solution then leaving it to stand. They discover that the pH is 6. State the color of the universal indicator at pH 6. Now you should roughly remember the colors of universal indicator which is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and violet. These are for different pH. Red is for pH 1 to 2. 
orange is for 3 to 4, yellow is for 5 to 6, green is for 7, blue is for 8 to 9, indigo is 10 to 11 pH and violet is 12 to 13. So for pH 6 we can write the color to be yellow. Part C that scientists believe that some fertilizer containing iodide ions has been added to the soil. Describe how the scientists could test the solution made from the soil for the presence of iodide ions and the result of the test if iodide ions are present. For the test of iodide ions you should remember that iodide ions react with silver nitrate aqueous in the presence of acid which is nitric acid aqueous to form a precipitate of silver iodide which is yellow in color. So this is a positive test for the presence of iodide ions. So we can write the test as Add aqueous silver nitrate solution Then add dilute nitric acid And the observations will be that yellow precipitate of silver iodide is formed So this tests for the presence of iodide ions. Question 5. Leaves of plants contain a number of different colored pigments. Four students want to extract and analyze some of these colored pigments. The leaves are chopped up and ground using mortar and pestle and then mixed with ethanol. This is pestle mortar and these are the leaves. The pigments are separated using paper chromatography. Suggest a reason for cutting and grinding of the leaves. Now cutting and grinding is done to extract the pigment from leaves. Four students do the paper chromatography separation. The diagram shows four sets of apparatus used by the students. Three of the students make mistakes in setting up the apparatus. Let's see at the apparatus. This is the first one A, B, C and D. In A we can see that spots of pigment are actually below the depth of ethanol which is wrong because now pigments will dissolve in the solution rather than being separated. In B, we can see that the pigments are above the ethanol, which is correct, but there is no lid on the apparatus. So what will happen? That ethanol will evaporate. In part C, we can see that spots of pigment are again below the depth of ethanol, which is incorrect and there is no lid. In D, we can see that spots are above the depth of ethanol. And also lead is present and the baseline is drawn in pencil which is all correct. While in A and B the baseline was drawn in ink so what happens that in the chromatogram ink separation also occurs. Which diagram A, B, C or D shows the correct setup of the apparatus. As we have already seen that diagram D is the correct one. Describe two mistakes made by the students shown in the diagrams. Explain why each mistake will prevent the chromatography from working correctly. As we have seen that mistake one was that pigment was below ethanol. And therefore we can say that pigment will not separate. by moving up the paper
it will actually dissolve in solvent. Mistake two was that there was no lid present. which causes evaporation of ethanol. Part 4 Chromatography often uses water in the beaker. Suggest why ethanol is used instead of water in this experiment. Now we can say that the solvent used is ethanol because pigments are better soluble in ethanol as compared to water. So we can write pigments dissolve or are soluble in ethanol. Part 5. What property of ethanol makes it hazardous to use in the laboratory? What safety precaution needs to be taken to avoid this hazard? As ethanol can easily evaporate, so it means that ethanol is flammable. So therefore no flames should be present nearby. Part B, the diagram shows the results for three known pigments, W, X and Y, and pigments from three plants. This is the solvent front, this is the baseline, and we have three pigments, W, X and Y, and these are the chromatogram of W, X and Y. Now we have cabbage, grass and spinach, whose chromatogram is given. Number one, how many pigments are there in grass? Explain your answer. Now from the chromatogram we can see that X pigment is present in grass as it is of same height as compared to grass. Again W pigment is also present in grass. Y pigment is also present in grass. So there are three visible pigments that are present in grass. So we can write a minimum of three pigments are present. because there are three visible spots on chromatogram. Which have same RF value or which have same distance as compared to these pigments. Part 2 which pigment is in all of the plants? Now we can see that X is present in cabbage, it is also present in grass, it is also present in spinach. So X is the pigment that is present in all of the plants. So we can write X Part 3. Calculate the RF value of pigment W. Now we know that RF is the distance travelled by pigment divided by distance travelled by solvent. So we can measure the distance from the diagram. This is pigment W and this is the solvent front. This is the baseline. 
Now we can see that the distance from baseline to the solvent front is 4.7 centimeters. While the distance traveled by pigment W is equal to 2.8 centimeters. So 2.8 divided by 4.7, the RF value comes equal to 0 0.6. Part 4. Which of the plants contain pigment W? Now in the diagram we can see that W pigment is present in grass. It is also present in spinach because it is of the same height. So we can write grass and spinach. Question 6. A student investigates the reactivity series by putting pieces of metals into aqueous solutions. The table shows the experiments. First is that metal copper is put into solution of magnesium sulfate. Now as we know that in reactivity series copper metal is below magnesium so no reaction will occur and the observation will be that there is no change. Second again, copper reacts with iron sulfate and there is no change. So it means copper cannot react with iron sulfate because copper is less reactive than iron. So we can say that the reactivity of copper is less than magnesium. It is less than iron. In third, metal magnesium is reacted with copper sulfate and red brown solid is formed. It means magnesium is more reactive than copper. So we can write magnesium is more reactive than copper. Similarly, magnesium reacts with zinc sulfate to form silver gray solids. So magnesium is more reactive than zinc. Then magnesium is reacted with iron sulfate and magnesium sulfate will be formed along with iron. So iron is gray black solid which is formed. So we can write Next is the reaction of metal iron with the solution to form red brown solid formed. Now reddish brown solid can be formed from copper and as iron is more active than copper so we can write the solution to be any solution of copper which is soluble for example copper sulfate. So we can infer that magnesium is more active than iron. And from this one we can say that iron is more reactive than copper. Then zinc reacts with iron sulfate to form grey black iron solid. So zinc is more reactive than iron. And in the last zinc cannot react with magnesium sulfate as zinc is less reactive than magnesium. A. Complete the table. We have already done that. B. Use the information in the table to arrange the four metals in order of reactivity starting with the most reactive first. Now as we can see that magnesium has replaced copper, zinc and iron. All three are replaced by magnesium so magnesium is the most reactive metal. On second number we have zinc because zinc can replace iron. But it is less reactive than magnesium so zinc is on second number. Then on third number we have iron which is more reactive than copper. So it means that on fourth number we would have copper. So we can write magnesium as first zinc then iron and in the last we have copper. Thanks for watching, a like, comment and subscribe will be highly appreciated. You can find related videos and playlists. Stay happy and enjoy learning.